Andrea, a general question. How much this approach of keeping the tumor in senescence is uh, successful in the moment that you withdraw the therapy? Because particularly if you look not only at the cell autonomous process, but also you have shown also looking at the environment, we know that all this kind of treatment will have a rebound effect. And particularly given the process of senescence that is the first gate towards acquisition of new mutations. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, if, so we, we try to also to uh, have a look at um, a different time point uh, uh, after the uh, in tumor inhibition, for, for instance, with the anti-6CR2 and, and I get in presence of the Shotax, and I can tell you that we don't see a relapse uh, of the tumor, but uh, of course we didn't do extensively, like for all the uh, uh, 12 months. So what I think that this could eventually happen, so the tumor will find a way in any case to escape, to bypass the senescence response. And perhaps in the future we should try to combine uh, this approach with, uh, uh, if we want to do pro-senescent therapy, uh, with the senolytic uh, therapy, so killing of the senescent cell or reprogramming uh, of the SASP. Uh, now there are some paper uh, where actually uh, has been shown that tumor that undergo to senescence can also promote tumor regeneracy. We don't see together, together with Pier Paolo and Scott Law and, and others uh, such an effect. So we see just tumor inhibition. Uh, but in patient, of course, docetaxel doesn't work at the end, you will relapse. So probably <laughs> the tumor find a way. A quite so, similar question. How much this approach could induce resistance to a second line chemotherapeutic approach? Yeah, that, that, that's, we don't know. We, we, sh we should actually to do, do, do all these experiments in mouse and, uh, and, and check it, right, but. Uh. Yeah. Very nice, Andrea. Yeah. You mentioned skewing of macrophage function was very impressive. Uh, and that caused the question, uh, the, the neutrophils that are associated with the SASP response, do they undergo functional skewing? There are claims of polarization of neutrophil function, and one and then two have been uh, used uh, as. That's a very, is, is the, very interesting question. Is there any question. hint that something so, like so that? So you're saying is the myeloid, the neutrophil that are there can become a macrophage and M2, right? No, whether uh, neutrophils change their function uh, and polarize to what has uh, been called N2. Yeah, so Did we, you happen we, to check? No, we, we are not looking at that, but we are just focusing now on macrophage. But um, we, we should do it, yeah. <laughs> So, Andrea, the, um, I guess, a field for P10 loss prostate cancer is very focused on AKT inhibitors, and we'll soon have big randomized trials with that data. Do you think that AKT blockade will impact that JAK-STAT, MDSC, you know, um, loop that you're talking about? Will AKT blockade impact that? Or is this just so downstream in, in, in carcinogenesis that AKT blockade will not impact that? Uh, th th that's a nice question. So we don't know that. We are doing the experiment, as you know, now in preclinical trial to understand whether uh, the AKT inhibitor in general target therapy could affect uh, also, uh, in general, the immune subset that infiltrates the tumors. Uh, we think that when we combine with the anti-6CR2, so we decrease the number of neutrophil of myeloid that enter in the tumor, we will see less STAT3 activation. So this is something that I can tell you probably will happen in the tumor. So this could also raise the question whether, for instance, uh, androgen deprivation therapy could be working again, right? Because sometimes it doesn't work because of stat uh, and so on. So I think that in the combination will, will tell us if, if this is real. So uh, we think less myeloid will be less stat signaling in, in the tumor and maybe more suscept susceptibility to conventional treatment. But this we have to do it. So we, and is there evidence that actually androgen deprivation induces the SASP phenotype? That's very interesting. So there are, uh, there are like, uh, uh, so we are doing also that. It's a very clear, good, good idea. And uh, there are like, uh, Michael Karim uh, published like a paper on B cell in supplementary figure 20. <laughs> it's reported that uh, at, they also have a, a reduction of uh, uh, myeloid uh, infiltration. However, he missed it uh, because it was focused on the B cell, right? So I expect that if we do androgen deprivation, we will have an, a, an enrichment of myeloid subset. That would be uh, interesting, because it would be a therapy that actually do the, do the opposite. This could give the rationale to combine. But Joan, uh, uh, yeah. I, as a comment, we, we tested 
pietriche inibitor, AK inibitor, in a P53 deficient, P10 deficient double knockout model, and they don't work. Uh, so uh, your data about uh, M2, M1 polarization, and our data of failure of pietric inhibition to uh, yield any efficacy suggests that uh, you are right. Probably if you go back to STAT3, and if STAT3 has anything to do with this, uh, you are too downstream. Because again, pietric A and, 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 and AK, I can be specific, AKT inhibition doesn't work in epithelial P53 null setting in our hands. Maybe we're using the wrong AKT. Uh, and I'm curious to see your trial data. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, thank you, Andrea. As, uh, as usual, very nice talk. Uh, you know I'm biased with uh, radiation, so <laughs> I was uh, interested in seeing in your slide that this uh, effect on block on myeloid cells by radiation of the spleen. But do you think we have to widen our field of radiation uh, from prostate to spleen? Or <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, I have, to be, I have to be honest, this was an idea of John, right? So uh, I always say this is a... No we, we don't have any data, right? So. Uh, there are different ideas, right? But uh, what I think is that this myeloid, uh, this should be considered like a neoplastic sort of myeloid. Indeed, in, back in the 70s, they were described originally as a sort of neoplastic expansion. So why, if we do it in patients that have a myeloid disorder, uh, why don't we do it also here, right? So this would be the rationale. Uh, to, uh, so if, if it doesn't work, but this is the next plan, right? If it, the 6R2 doesn't work, we will try to implement it. But <laughs> I, want, I want to say one thing because anyway, I look into this, and uh, you may know or not know that uh, in models, if you because the idea was if we ablate the marrow from a mouse that is, uh, you know, in which the granulocytic or myeloid compound is trained by the tumor, if you replenish with the wild type fresh marrow. Are you already did? Yes. No, but uh, it's, <laughs> many people did it already because okay. no, we, we, we you understand this. that if this was true, you could in theory cure cancer. The ultimate immune therapy would be to re replace a wild type yeah. naive marrow and this should work. Mm -hmm. Graft versus tumor and also reprogramming and it doesn't. There are plenty of data out that uh, simply working on the or replenish fresh. Uh, I, I had this idea a uh, mm -hmm. couple of years ago, and we started saying, let's do it. Let's transplant all these models with wild type marrow because they are black six, so you can do it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. it, okay. it doesn't work as well as you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, if, uh, if they are the, if you get in situ, you would go back to square one, you're saying. Yeah. And that is the problem, perhaps. 